Welcome to Recalculating America. Like its award-winning book, Recalculating is dedicated to small business in America and has been named the best small business book in the Independent Press Awards competition. Each Recalculating program is dedicated to helping small business leaders add profits through efficient growth. During every Recalculating program, experts will give listeners useful information about starting or growing their small business. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the editor-in-chief of the Small Business Digest. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years experience in managing money. He specializes in helping small business owners make their money work as hard as they do. Dan, our next guest is Emily Blackstone. She's a fascinating woman who's here to, uh, uh, to talk about uh, women and venture capital, which uh, she's going to tell us some very interesting facts. Emily, welcome to the program. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your company, and where people can reach you before we do anything else. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is actually Emily Brackstone with uh, BR. Uh, I get that mistake a lot, <laughs> so don't worry about it. Um, so I'm actually a shareholder with Baker Donaldson in Memphis, Tennessee, um, Baker Donaldson is the largest law firm in the Southeast. We've got about 800 attorneys and public policy advisors and 24 offices uh, spanning from Texas to Florida. And uh, we're also in the D.C. and Baltimore area with our recent merger with the Overtaylor Law Firm. So we are a full-service firm uh, serving clients in all industries in practice areas. Um, I happen to be the vice chair of our emerging company team, so I'm a corporate lawyer by training, and I serve as outside, outside general counsel for several high-growth startups, and um, I routinely assist those startups with just their general corporate uh, fundraising and M&A needs. Um, and I'd also like to tell you a little bit about our emerging company team. Um, that's a team of attorneys at Baker Donaldson that have different specialties. So we have patent lawyers, trademark lawyers, employment lawyers, corporate lawyers like me um, that are all focused on working with startups. And uh, so we pride ourselves on being very practical in offering legal solutions for startups. Dan? You know, it's interesting uh, the uh, – uh, what, 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 the way Don introduced you is your specialty is, uh, or your firm, or you in the firm, specialty is working with women in startups. Is, is that a is that a growing business? Yeah, so I see that a lot in my practice, and I don't know if it's because I'm a female attorney. Um, you know, these female startup founders are kind of drawn to working with me. Uh, but I have a ton of startups that are women-led startups that are clients of mine, uh, so much so that our office receptionist even commented to me one day as she would see the parade of female clients that I was meeting with. You know, she was asking me, where where was I meeting all these women? You, you know, who are all these women that you're meeting with? So it's definitely a growing segment of my own practice. If you look at that particular segment of your practice, is there a is there a common thread meaning are women gravitating to certain kinds of businesses or is it across the board? I would say it's across the board. Um, you know, I represent women led companies and everything from med device and life sciences to, you know, what you would think of as more traditionally women dominated industries like real estate. Um so yeah, I think it does run the spectrum are you um, uh, if you look at your client base the people who are new entrepreneurs startups are they uh, more mature women or are they millennials or or what um I would say it's mostly younger women who are interested in you know building these high growth tech startups and uh, I'm a millennial myself so, um, you know, that may be part of it, just them liking working with one of their peers. Uh, but it, there are a lot of millennial women, digital natives, who are out there building tech companies. 
So what about the, what about the more mature women whose children are raised? They're out of college now. They're they're true empty nesters. Do you see uh, older women looking at starting businesses? I think that older women are starting businesses. Um, with the client base that I'm targeting, I'm really going after the high growth startups, you know, those who are interested in scaling their businesses rapidly and taking on outside investments such as venture capital um, and hopefully moving toward either an IPO or an acquisition. Um, so that's really what I'm targeting. And so I don't see, a, you know, a ton of uh, women crossing my desk who are forming more traditional businesses, um, but I know that they're out there. So when you look at your practice and you look at the businesses that the millennials are starting, is it primarily tech? Um, yes, I would say it's tech, and there's also a lot of uh, you know science-based companies. There are a lot of really um, smart younger people who are pursuing their PhDs and who are very entrepreneurial, um, which I think is great because I, I think so long, um, you know, there's been amazing research going on in our institutions, and that technology just ends up sitting on a shelf and never ending up being commercialized. So I think the entrepreneurial nature of millennials, you know, they not only want to do the research and validate their research, but they want to get that product out to market and, you know, see some success that way. Do you see that uh, – I'm sorry, go ahead, Don. No, no, keep it, Dan. You're on a roll. Uh, I'm just curious about the millennials. Are you seeing a lot of people that have very little work experience are wanting to start new businesses? Or are these people that have worked somewhere else and have gained some knowledge and experience and now are trying to go out on their own? I would say it's a mix of both. Um, you know, some people have corporate business experience and they felt like the corporate world really didn't suit them and decided to strike out on their own and, and build something themselves. Um, others are kind of serial entrepreneurs, I guess you could say, They'll start a business, and if that business doesn't work, they'll move on to something else and, and gain experience through those failures, actually. Do you, uh, do you find uh, uh, capital hard to come by, or are people, uh, investors, uh, anxious to uh, invest in this group of new entrepreneurs? Um, I would say capital is always hard to come by. Um, it's a tough market right now. Um, I think also, you know, I practice in Memphis, Tennessee. So if you look at where venture dollars are being invested, 75% uh, of that money is going to Silicon Valley, New York, and Boston. So if you're outside of those hubs, it, it can be very challenging to raise venture capital. Although I do think there is a push by those venture capital firms to kind of get out of the valley, so to speak, and see what other deals are out there, just because there's so much competition in those markets for deals. Everybody's chasing the same deal. You know, they're trying to find the next Facebook and Twitter. Um, but it's definitely a challenge for entrepreneurs, particularly if they're pre-revenue, um, you know, because, of course, investors are trying to minimize their own risk. They want to see some traction with the business. And so if you've been able to generate a customer base and generate some revenue, you're going to be more likely to be able to get that investment. Dan, Go ahead. Dan can I jump in here and ask, uh, uh, one of the things that, that I saw in uh, in your background is your, your uh, belief that uh, per, uh, women get just uh, – a relatively low percentage of the money invested. Uh, is that the case? Why is it the case, and how can they change that? Yeah, so this is a, a huge problem in the industry, and I think that there is growing awareness around it, but, uh, you know, and there are incremental improvements, but there is still a long, long way to go. Um, I looked at some recent statistics, and they say that, approximately 1% of women-owned businesses 
or raising venture capital, which is consistent across the board for both women and and male-owned businesses. It's just a small fraction that are able to raise that institutional capital. But what I've found even more troubling is only just over 2% of venture dollars that are invested are going to women-led companies. So the other 98% are going to men. And so that's a huge, huge gap that has to be overcome. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, when you have a gap that that is that large, you know, I don't think you can point to one single reason for it. Uh, I think it's a whole host of things. Um, You know, everything ranging from a lack of women in the STEM industries, you know, because venture capital, they're typically looking at tech or science companies. There's still a dearth of women in those industries. So until we until we close that gap, I think that's going to continue to be an issue. Um, there's, frankly, a lack of women, you know, in decision-making positions at the venture capital firms, which I think is having a huge impact. You know, a lot of women are targeting other women with their businesses, and if they're pitching to male VCs, the men may not understand their target market and may not be able to see the value of their company. So I think that's a big problem. And then finally, I think there's a lot of just, you know, unconscious bias that happens. And I actually see this in my own law practice as a female attorney. You know, people have these notions in their head as to what a successful CEO looks like. And by and large, when people are, you know, picturing what that CEO looks like, they're picturing a man. And so I think when women go in to pitch these VCs, they really struggle against that. Well, I want to continue on that, but we have to stop for a minute and uh, to hear from one of our sponsors. But we'll be back right after this message. Don't let hackers get your data. Email is insecure and can't handle large files. Instead, use BISCOM's Secure File Transfer product. Military-grade security that's as easy to use as email, and it can handle attachments of any size. Visit BISCOM.com for your free trial and make sure your private communications stay private. That's B-I-S-C-O-M dot com. We're talking with Emily Blackstone. She's a lawyer uh, uh, in the Middle South, um, who, who knows an awful lot about venture capital, and we're talking about the fact of how uh, women get very little of the venture dollars. I have to tell you, Emily, uh, my wife, who's a Harvard Business School graduate, uh, went to a recent uh, pitch session in New York City, and there were 13 uh, companies pitched, and there was exactly one woman in the entire group of the 13 uh, uh, pitch groups. Uh, in the, mm-hmm. And in the audience, she was the only woman. So um, mm-hmm. I, I found that fascinating when, uh, when uh, you were coming on. She mentioned that fact to me. But uh, um, uh, let me ask you, you you've given s- several very good reasons, but um, w- what are the keys? How does a, uh, should a a woman or a man, for that matter, pitch a VC. You know, the, um, one of the things you notice is how uh, the pitch is, is often, uh, they look at it uh, at Shark Tank and think that's the way to do it, but uh, it's a little different in the venture capital pitch. Will you talk about mm-hmm. that? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, first of all, it's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, VCs are extremely picky, And they're really looking for those unicorns, right, those billion-dollar opportunities. And so, you know, venture capital may not be right for your business. You know, so I would say the first question I would ask is, should you even be trying to pitch VCs? Are you a good fit for what they're looking for? Um, You know, a lot of them have industry focus. So really paying attention to the investment philosophy of those funds that you're targeting, I think is very helpful. Um, And then when it comes to the pitch itself, they tend to be very formulaic. Um, And I know here at the accelerators, 
startup accelerators that I help out with um, in Memphis, they do tons and tons of training on the art of the pitch. And it all starts with identifying the problem that your startup is trying to solve and, you know, going through what that is, what the market opportunity is, who the team is that you've put together. Um, you know, all those things come together to, to create a successful pitch. But I, I think it's important to remember there are resources out there. You know, if, if people are struggling trying to put their pitch deck together or, you know, need someone to, to help them hone their pitch, so many cities, you know, even outside of the startup hubs, like Silicon Valley and Boston, so many cities have these startup incubators or other nonprofits that are aimed at giving support to startups and can really help help them with their pitch. Dan, you want to uh, ask I, Emma? I do. I, I want to ask a question. Um, <clears throat> the question I'm interested in is, uh, who are the people that are loaning the money? It, it appears from what you're saying that it's predominantly male, that the, 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 the men that control the vast majority of the venture capital or private equity investments that are made. But as the women investors, the women entrepreneurs grow their businesses and begin to sell those businesses for money, do you see this, this explosion of women entrepreneurs creating a new generation of venture capitalists that are women that will bring some more balance to the the imbalance that you've talked about. Yes, and I'm so hopeful for that, and I have seen some evidence of that. Um, I know here in the southeast where I practice, there are a couple of funds that are really aimed at investing in women-led startups like the Jump Fund in Chattanooga comes to mind. I've, I've had a cl couple clients get investments from that fund. Um, Valor Ventures in Atlanta is another. So you do see, you know, women going out, forming their own venture capital funds, and really trying to create opportunities for other women, which I, I think is amazing. Um, I've also seen a proliferation of, of these startup accelerators that are targeting women-led startups. Um, we have one here in Memphis called Upstart, which I think was one of the first in the whole country. Um, there's another one I had a client go through over in Boulder called Merge Lane, and those accelerators are just focused entirely on supporting women's efforts as they try to build these high-growth startups. You mentioned uh, three areas of the country, Silicon Valley, Boston, and New York. In your practice, uh, have you ever come across a client that has a great idea? Have you ever told them to move to California, New York, or Boston? Um, it's interesting. So I, I wouldn't really be in a position to advise them to move their business, but I have had a couple clients make that choice. Um, one was at the direction of some of their angel investors. They had raised some local money here in Memphis. And it was really important to those investors that they move out to Silicon Valley to try to build their business just because of the nature of the business. Um, but I think because it's so, so expensive <laughs> to operate out there, um, you know, unless you're in a tech space or, you know, in an industry where you really need to be there, um, I think if you can try to build it outside of those hubs, you you may be better off in the long run. So uh, today, when you have a new client walking into the door, uh, what stage are they when they see you? Um, so I I represent pretty early stage companies. Uh, you know everything from idea stage where they haven't even formed a corporation yet to a bit later stage where you know, they may have an entity in place. They may have a few employees, some revenue. So it kind of runs the spectrum. Have you ever had to tell a client, you're not ready or, or I really can't help you? 
Um, it does happen from time to time, and, you know, we are lawyers in a service industry, and, you know, not everybody can afford legal help at the very, very outset of their business if they're trying to bootstrap or sell funds. So, you know, we try to be very practical in terms of, you know, when they engage with the lawyer. They may call me and say, you know, here's what I've got going on, and I'll say, call me in six months. <laughs> you know, call me when, when you know, you're ready to bring on an employee or whatever, and we can go ahead and get started. But it's just too early stage. Got it. Uh, let me ahead. just interrupt one second, Dan. We're talking with Emily Blackstone. Emily, how can uh, people uh, reach you your, and your company? P- please give us that because uh, three or four people have already sent uh, emails. How do I reach her? Oh, great, great. Yeah, so we have a website. It's bakerdonaldson.com. That's Baker is in Howard Baker. And then D is in dog, O N E L. Yes. Um, you can look me up. It's Emily Braxton, uh, B-R-A-C-K-S-T-O-N-E. You'll be able to look at my bio and some of my experience. My contact information is there. Um, we've also got a great landing page on that website for our emerging company team. We have a video series that we push out every week called the Entrepreneur Minute, where we... Um, they're just little quick tips for entrepreneurs, minute-long videos that are both um, shot by attorneys, but then others in the ecosystem, such as investors or CEOs of companies. So I think some of your listeners may find those to be useful. Back to you, Dan. Uh, thank you. How much time do we have, Don? About four, four and a half minutes, Dan. Okay. Uh, I, I want to go back to the beginning. Um, in, in my work as, a, as an entrepreneur and a, an investment advisor with 40 some years of experience, I have found that the the principal reasons that small businesses fail is not because they don't have a good ID. They are woefully undercapitalized, and they uh, so the capital uh, nobody seems to be able to tell people are willing to tell people how much that it's going to take to get started. Can you, in the, in the types of clients that you have, what kind of money should a person be looking to raise as a startup that actually starts the business? Yes, yeah, so I think it depends a lot on the type of business. Um, and I think you can back into a number when you look at what you're trying to get to, right? I mean, you may be trying to reach a certain milestone where you feel like once you've reached that milestone, you can go after the institutional money or angel capital um, and kind of back into it that way. But it, it can vary so much from if you're, you know, trying to build a high-growth startup and you really need to, you know, get your technology off the ground versus a more traditional business where you may have some upfront leasing costs or things of that nature. So it, it just really pays to kind of sit down and, and maybe even sit down with a financial advisor and try to figure out realistically what your projections are and how much money you need to raise. So do you, do you find that, um, that people, a lot of people or a number of people, are, in fact, undercapitalized? Absolutely. Yeah, we call it the startup valley of death, <laughs> where these companies, you know, they get off the ground, and then it's a struggle trying to get through it, slog it out until you can get to the point where you have the traction to raise money. Um, you know, a lot of companies are out there self-funding their businesses. You know, they may rack up credit card debt. They may be hitting up friends and family for money. Um you know, they have tons and tons of hustle, um, but and which you really have to have <laughs> to make it through that. Last question, Dan. What's the success rate of the people that you work with? How many make it? <laughs> um, so, I mean, we work with so many early, early stage that, you know, a lot of them do end up failing. Um, and then, you know, you may see the same founder start up again. 
So, and we're still kind of waiting on that huge exit, like a you know a Twitter or Facebook style exit to come out of Memphis or the Southeast. Um, so fingers crossed for that to happen in the next couple of years. I think we've we've got a few contenders there, but I mean there's a lot of failure in in the startup world, uh, unfortunately, and we do see that. Well, thank you so much for your time and your insight for joining us today, Don. No, Emily Blackstone. Really, thank you again. Um, uh, uh, we look forward to inviting you back uh, next year when hopefully uh, things will be even better for women. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good day. You too. Hate your old fax machine? You can now fax through email. Simply write an email, attach the document, and send. Works with all major email providers. Get rid of the noisy and expensive old fax machine and try Biscom's Cloud Fax. Our solutions are great for businesses of all sizes. Visit Biscom.com for your free trial. That's B-I-S-C-O-M dot com. You know, Dan, today uh, we, are we are going to talk with John Gaynor. He says uh, the drug his company has created to treat cancer, stroke, heart attacks, and respiratory disease which are now in trials, would have never happened if it not for small pharma. Gaynor is a former professor at the University of Virginia and CEO of the publicly traded company Diffusion Pharmaceuticals. John, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Tell John, this is Dan. Oops, go ahead, go ahead, Don. No, I was just going to say, uh, t uh, John, tell us a little bit about yourself your company, your website, and a little bit of your background. Okay. Uh, 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 there w it was a mistake earlier that I'm not the CEO of the company. I'm the chief scientific officer. Uh, but the, the company started here in Charlottesville, Virginia, because I was teaching here at the University of Virginia, and I, was, I became very interested in how oxygen uh, – and getting more oxygen to people that needed more oxygen uh, could would, could happen. And I actually had developed a drug that I thought would get more oxygen out of your blood and into the tissues of your body that weren't getting enough oxygen. And um, so I, I went to the, uh, the, the, this is very useful for people who've lost a lot of blood, for example, uh, hemorrhagic shock, which is called, and it, it, it's what, what it's actually what's responsible for 100% of battlefield casualties. So I went to both the uh, Army and the Navy with grant proposals, uh, which you know professors need to do their research, and uh, the Navy granted uh, my uh, they, they funded my my grant proposal, and so I was able to develop. A, a totally new uh, compound, which will get more oxygen out of your blood, uh, and at the same time, it will put more oxygen back into your blood so that you're, there's no net loss. Uh, but uh, it will, it, it was for people who had had severe uh, bl blood losses on the, uh, say, on the battlefield or in an accident, they, they, they might live longer because they'd be getting oxygen longer, and their, and their tissue, tissues wouldn't die. And we did a lot of animal studies, and other other universities also did some animal studies uh, to show that this is, the drug indeed worked that way. And uh, so, um, the uh, uh, d d during all this research, uh, uh, the uh, University of Virginia's patent office so they were pursuing a patent on this compound, and uh, they had a lot of other things on their plate, so they. Uh, actually released the, the rights, the patent rights to me, and I, I, I got the, the patent and, uh, on, on the compound, and so then I went to meet uh, a man here in Charlottesville, uh, his name was David Calaris, and he had a, also had a job at the University of Virginia, uh, in which he paired up professors who had ideas with, with people who might have some money to invest in those ideas. And so, actually, he decided to quit his job and paired himself up with me 
and he became the, and is the CEO of the company, and he handles all, all of the financial dealings, and I'm the science officer, and I handle all the science dealings. And so that's how our, our company started. We actually started in 2001. I realize this is 16 years later, and you say, well, why haven't you made a profit yet? It really takes a long time. I understand the average time for developing a new drug takes 18 years. We haven't quite hit that yet. But we, we, we've actually had the, the drug in a phase three uh, uh, trial for treating glioblastoma. And um, so our, our company name is Diffusion, D-I-F-F-U-S-I-O-N. I, I sometimes joke that it rhymes with confusion, but hopefully it doesn't. And the, uh, we're in, uh, our, our website is diffusionpharma.com. Well, thank you for that information. Thank you for that information. Um, but let me give you my first observation. Um, based on what I read about you and your company and what I just heard from you, you have, I wouldn't even call it a breakthrough drug. It's almost a miracle because if if I can if I'm following what you're saying and what you're writing, you have the uh, with this drug you have the ability to perhaps significantly impact mortality in the United States and throughout the world. Have you thought about that? Yes, yeah. You, you can't help you can't help but think about it, uh, and, and but you with, it, with of course with the FDA you have to show it for each indication that you're talking about, you know, whether it's for heart or whether it's for lungs or whether it's for cancer. You have to do each of those individually, so you actually have to, you have to limit your thinking to, to chunks of people that you, you're affecting. And that, that's what makes you really, I guess that make, makes a lot of things worthwhile. Uh, we, we had the uh, some people in our last clinical trial, which, which was for glioblastoma, which is primary brain tumor, which is uh, usually pretty fatal, uh, we, we had people in our clinical trial writing back to us saying, thank you for giving me my life back. And when you, you, you get an email like that, it really strikes you. Well, I can imagine it does. I mean, it, 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 if, as your drug does more, and as, as we talked before the show, uh, sometimes when you're in a phase three clinical trial, uh, as you begin to show results to the FDA, they can get you, sometimes will give you a uh, an accelerated approval based on the evidence uh, over a period of time in your clinical trial so that you don't have to go the full three years. My, I guess my, my question, my, my question, though, is how do you and your investors stay independent? Because if you have the miracle drug, Big Pharma is going to come after you with unbelievable amounts of money. And, uh, and, and there's a perhaps an inherent conflict of interest there because... While you have spent uh, a great deal of your life developing this, developing, developing this uh, cure, uh, Big Pharma has other motives based on their pipeline and what they've done to not necessarily cure but treat people. So, have you thought about that? Uh, well, yeah, I kind of. I, I guess I disagree with you that Big Pharma will come after us with, with big money. You, this this, this uh, approach uh, of, of using this drug to increase the diffusion of oxygen out of the bloodstream and into hypoxic tissues is it, totally new with us. And uh, Big Pharma maybe not quite, I, I, I don't want to say anything uh, derogatory. I, all I say is that there's a lot of Me Too drugs out, out in Big Pharma. This is so they maybe don't. I, I'm not sure this concept they would quite understand. Uh, and again, I don't want to say that in the wrong way to trust people, but 
uh, they, a lot of drugs being uh, uh, developed now are, are, are for lesser indi indications, smaller smaller indications. And, and uh, there are pharmaceutical companies that are actually closing their research labs. So no, nothing, there's nothing new out there. And what we're trying to say is, yes, there is something new out there. Well, let me tell you, I, I just recently was involved in a situation where a company had developed a, uh, a piece of technology that uh, did, did wonderful things for people with uh, poor circulation. And they, they spent about six years developing the, the apparatus. Uh, they came to the market on the web, and with the four weeks, they were offered a huge amount of money to buy the company, and and, and they sold it um, because the, the the financial offer was so overpowering. Uh, they just couldn't envision that people would would pay that kind of money, tens of millions of dollars, for uh, their equipment. But but they did, and they sold it. And so I, I understand your 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 reluctance to believe that it's possible, but it is possible. But um, tell us about tell us about the other applications of your your new drug and technology. Well, uh, it, it, in any place that uh, there, people need more oxygen is, is, is can be treated. Most people don't think that's true of cancer, and actually, with with cancer. Uh, the tumors themselves have very low oxygen levels, and it's been known for years that if you could oxygen level the tumors uh, to increase that, then radiation therapy, chemotherapy was more efficient. This radiation therapy are the two main ways cancer is treated, and we have, we demonstrated in our phase two trial that adding our drugs uh, with uh, brain tumors. Uh, for radiation, it did increase the efficiency of the radiation, and uh, so the radiation is essentially more powerful, and you, you get more uh, uh, tumor uh, reduction. Uh, in our in our upcoming trial, we're going to add a, to chemotherapy also for brain tumors. So we'll be adding a. Uh, we have very good uh, data, laboratory data, that should that. It should also be chemotherapy. So that, that's an area that you might not think of that would need more oxygen. Uh, the, the, right. obvious one, uh, the more obvious ones that involve, you know, lungs. And uh, we, we, we've, had a great, we've had a great deal of uh, published by other, actually other laboratories, about using our drugs for stroke. And, and so uh, treating stroke might be an excellent uh, uh, a place for us to also do a clinical trial. It, it's the second leading cause of death in the United States. Um, so uh, those are probably more immediate ideas. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so that we 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 concentrated on on, uh, on on cancer up to now, but we 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 hope, we hope to branch out coming year and, and look at these other areas like or, or maybe. Maybe uh, ischemic limb. We, we, we've done it. We've also done a phase two clinical trial in treating people who have peripheral artery disease. These, these are people that can't walk for more than a minute of developing severe pain in their legs. So they can't get out of their car and get into the grocery store in that time. Uh, it, 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 it's just totally debilitating as far as leads to life. And uh, uh, I think about 8 million U.S. have it. But and so we did a phase two trial on that. So it's possible that we could also do another uh, phase two or three trial at that area. Dan, we have to take a break here for a, mi a minute while we hear from w one of our sponsors, and then we'll, we'll be right back with John uh, Gaynard, who's chief uh, science officer at the Fusion Pharmaceutical. Don't let hackers get your data. Email is insecure and can't handle large files. Instead, use Biscom's Secure File Transfer product. 
military-grade security that's as easy to use as email, and it can handle attachments of any size. Visit Biscom.com for your free trial and make sure your private communications stay private. That's B-I-S-C-O-M dot com. We're back with John Gaynor, Chief Science Officer at Diffusion Pharma. Uh, Dan, could I jump in here for a question that just came across uh, 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 my uh, computer uh, from a sure. listener? Um, right ahead. Uh, John, um, um, the listener says, and I, uh, frankly, I'm a little confused. Um, your drug, uh, in effect, allows, uh, helps uh, the body generate additional oxygen to fight cancer and other uh, illnesses. Did I hear that correctly? And could you explain a little once again for our audience? Uh, I... I, I if I understand the question right, the, the, the listener wants to know how this drug gets gets, uh, get, gets more oxygen into into the body where it's needed. Is that correct? Well, the the, the base question was, did, did we hear correctly that uh, uh, your drug um, helps the body uh, generate additional oxygen from the red blood cells to fight illness? But, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that the word generated kind of threw me there for a minute. Uh, and, and the red blood cells don't generate oxygen. They get the oxygen that you breathe in. But the, the listeners write that's how the uh, oxygen is carried throughout the body is with the red blood cells. And that's exactly what the, the, the drug is meant to do. It, it moves the oxygen that comes off the red blood cells faster uh, over to the, the, the vessel wall. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so that in a given period of time, you get a higher concentration at, at the vessel wall, and so that in increases the uh, force behind the oxygen movement to the tissue. Hmm. That, that's fascinating. You know, you know, I know just enough medical to be dangerous, but I, uh, I remember that uh, it used to be that you kept the uh, wounds uh, covered. And now, it, uh, if I'm co correct, the uh, wounds kind of are allowed to breathe because oxygen is such a great healer. Uh, 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 am I on the right track, or am I all wet? No, no, you're you're on the right right track. We we've, we've done uh, experimental studies with our drug, looking at wound healing, uh, and uh, it, it should be helpful there too. Okay. Um, I have one more question, Dan. I'll t put it back to you. Um, uh, o over the years, um, are your investors there? Well, yes, we're all in for the return, but they, do they also uh, are doing it because they feel that this is a way to really help um, fight cancer and other drugs? And, and uh, um, how did you set up your company? Uh, okay, the, the company was set up originally as a Virginia LLC, and uh, it, during this past year, we actually became a public company through a, through a reverse merger, and uh, that, that the company we, we merged with was uh, a public company, and uh, we, uh, we merged with them, and then we took over that company, and... Uh, so then we, we 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 were at first we we were over the counter, but now we're on the Nasdaq, and, and uh, but, so uh, all of this has been a change. Oh, I mean now there's now they they have stock they can buy and sell, and this before it was all investors, and obviously investors like to get their money back a little quicker than they've gotten it back from us. Uh, and we understand that. that that's why they're such wonderful people that, that uh, you know, actually believe that we're going to help. And uh, it, it, I think there are a lot of people out there in this country that really want to help people. And uh, so I think there's probably a, a lot of money to tap for small companies to, to that. Uh, but I can't say enough about how patient and good our investors have been. Dan? Yes, thank you, Don. Uh, John, um, how many employees do you have? Uh, right now, we have we have eight employees. 
Eight employees. Right. At tr- a, so true, we, a true small True small business. At true small business, yeah. We 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 uh, we don't we don't, uh, we, we, we we but we have to do all the same things that the Pfizer's and the Mercs of the world have to do. We we don't get any shortcuts because of that, you know. So right, it, it's, right, right. Cl- clinical trials cost the same amount, but they're a much bigger part of our budget than it is of, of, of a larger company. Are you are you what they call a penny stock? Uh, we were a penny stock when we were over the counter, uh, but uh, not, being on the Nasdaq, we're not really. We're, we're not very expensive right now, but we're not really a penny stock. And what what is your current share price? I can't exactly tell you. It's probably around three dollars. Hmm. Okay, okay. Let me go back to uh, clinical. Uh, it's, as I was listening to your your discussion about some of the things that you're thinking about doing. Have you have you thought about the impact of this process on um, pulmonary embolism, which uh, diminished lung capacity? Uh, we, we, people have mentioned this to us, yes, a, a, as a possible. We've had a lot of different indications mentioned to us because there are, I mean, oxygen is necessary for life, so there's, if something goes wrong and, and some part of you is not getting enough oxygen, something's going to happen. And, and right. So we've we've had a lot of a lot of things mentioned to us as as, as uh, things that we should work on. And with with the number of people, you can see that we have a, a limited amount that we can do. Do you? Uh, if we could go back to the business side, I know that you're the chief science officer, but you obviously also know a lot about the financials and, and the structure of the company. Um, do you have enough working capital to do these experiments, or are you looking at a possible equity raise to, to generate more capital to expand your research? Well, we, we just had an equity raise uh, in, in order to pay for our, our, our clinical trials. And, you know, the more the more trials you do, the, of course, you know, it's always possible that you're going to need another equity raise. And so, um, uh, do your employees have ownership of the company? Uh, uh, I I don't think very many of our our employees actually have uh, uh, own stock in the company. Uh, okay. And and if you look out past this clinical trial, uh, this one you're in right now, where do you go next? Well, if the if the trial is successful, we we obviously will be filing for what's called an NDA, a new drug application, with the FDA, right. and that that would allow us to sell the drug commercially. And and our, our manufacturing process is already developed, so we, we we can step right into a, a commercial manufacturing. That 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 won't be a problem because we we already have it developed. When a when a small small business starts out with a unique idea, and then they have a uh, in your case the drug where you have a uh, proof of concept and you go for a, a new drug application, the next really important spot is how do I distribute the drug? So have you looked beyond the clinical trials and say okay? I'm going to file a new drug application. I'm going to get approval to market the drug. How am I going to how am I going to distribute it? Have you thought about that yet? We have we have thought about that, but uh, it, 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 right now the drug is only an injectable, and it would be given in a for cancer, obviously in a cancer treatment center, and there's only a limited number of those. I don't know how many, probably 1,500 or so in the country. So, so you don't need a huge sales force to cover that. And, and uh, so, uh, it, it it may not the the distribution. Uh, I mean, it's right now it's it's not an oral pill. We're 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 working on that and, uh, on the on developing an oral pill, but it's not there. Uh, that that you know, I think you have a lot more problems with distribution. Uh, than where somebody else has to deliver the drugs to you. Yeah, because you're, as, as, I, as I understand what you're 
what you're trying to do. Cancer is just one element of what you're doing. You have other diseases that that may not be in centers like uh, Cancer Centers of America. So it's a different distribution model. So, uh, and if you thought about one of the, one of the things that seems to be uh, moving uh, a new technology, that's an old, a new and old technology that seems to be gaining some traction, is um, I saw a commercial uh, a couple of days ago on a drug, and they're positioning it as a uninjectable, meaning you don't inject it. Um, and then, and there are other companies now looking at alternative compounds that can be delivered in a dosage in inhalers so that you don't even need a needle to inject. Have you thought about alternative delivery systems other than just yeah, injecting? Yeah, and, and, and we, we have actually done experiments in, in, in the techniques that you just mentioned. Uh, and... Uh, you know, the theoretically, I mean, from, from our experiments, the, the, those delivery systems would work. Uh, so we, we haven't really, uh, I, we're not really there. I, most people think of, you know, uh, treating something as having having an, uh, an oral form of the pill, a tablet, or something like that. And uh, but so it, it it all takes money because for every type, every single type of uh, administration that you come up with, you have to do extensive studies, toxicology studies uh, in, in two species of animals to get that approved by the FDA. So it all, it, it's all very, uh, it, it's very much uh, a, a, a financial problem. Sure. You, did you? Did I understand you to say that uh, uh, that uh, John, that you? Have experimented with in inhalers. Uh, just, just in animals. Okay, hmm. and and it's, it's effectiveness as far as getting into the system and doing the work. Is how does it compare to needles? I, I don't have a direct comparison. I say it's pretty similar, but not, but not the, the best way to make sure that this, this drug acts inside the bloodstream. Obviously, if it's going to interact with, with, with the red cells and have the oxygen move through the bloodstream. And so it has to get inside the blood vessels. And the way to make sure you have 100% of the drug in, inside the blood vessels is to put it there uh, and do yeah. it with mm. intravenous then, And that's why, why we do it in our clinical trials right now. All right. Just, just on. I hate to interrupt, but um, we're, we're out of time. This has been a fascinating uh, pro program um, uh, interview uh, and, and we have to invite John Gaynor back uh, at some point but at this point uh, we, uh, we need to move on. Uh, we've been talking with John Gaynor, he's Chief Science Officer of Diffusion Ph Pharmaceuticals um, he's got a fascinating new uh, drug that he's developing that really holds out hope for the future we, and we thank him so much for being with us. Thank you, John. Well, thank you very much. Thank we, you. We're going to go to a commercial break, and then we're going to have our uh, next guest. Hate your old fax machine? You can now fax through email. Simply write an email, attach the document, and send. Works with all major email providers. Get rid of the noisy and expensive old fax machine. And try Biscom's Cloud Fax. Our solutions are great for businesses of all sizes. Visit Biscom.com for your free trial. That's B-I-S-C-O-M dot com. Uh, Dan, it's not, uh, now time for you to talk about uh, your th uh, thought for today before uh, uh, we talk, uh, we, we give our listeners a taste of your tip for today. But first, okay. uh, what, what's your thoughts uh, thought for on small business for today? Uh, the world is is coming to a standstill uh, today because the, everybody in the media is hyping uh, 
the James Comey testimony before the Senate Intelligence Committee. I heard it on this morning. Uh, I'm on my way to Sarasota to meet some people for our, our foundation. A bar opened at 6, six o'clock this morning uh, in San Francisco that is going to be serving free drinks every time Donald Trump tweets something about what's James Comey. And so a lot of people, there are some businesses that have given their employees the morning off to listen to Mr. Comey's testimony based on his uh, his free submission. I think a lot of people are going to be disappointed. Uh, I, I think that we are distracted away from what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to do is to turn this economy around. And when you have this kind of a distraction, you interrupt momentum. And we need to build momentum and continue to increase the momentum for America to, be, to begin growing again. I saw the... Uh, the jobless claims numbers, they were up a few thousand over last week, uh, about 243,000. So it seems to be kind of hit a plateau. Uh, but I think a lot of people in small business are wondering what's going to happen. When, when is the government going to start focusing on helping us grow our business? And right now, <laughs> the Congress is not focused on helping them small business, and I think it, the longer it goes without them taking a serious look at what you and I need and our listeners need in small business, the more the momentum may begin to di- diminish and, and die. Well, uh, Dan, we had a uh, – I, I wanted to ask you a question. We had someone on our program, uh, Al Dorso, who talked about the fact that he didn't have a college education. Yeah, was a very successful right. entrepreneur. Um, I want. Uh, what do you say about that? Um, uh, what's your thought on that? Well, I'm going to surprise you. You ready for this, Don? I'm wa- I'm wa- waiting. I may not be as surprised as you think. I don't have a college education either. You, I, you don't show it, Dan. <laughs> How do you show not not having a college education? I have a lot of life experience, <clears throat> and um, so uh, I, I do think that there is, you know, Don. It was a great great thing. I enjoyed that interview. It was a terrific interview. Uh, his relationship with his son <clears throat> and the de- desire of him wanting his son to take over the business for him as he gets older. Uh, They have college degrees. But um, uh, I I think that we have, for the longest period of time, have uh, created a a terrible mystique in this country that you cannot be successful unless you have a college degree. And yet if you look at the dropout rate and the failure rate in college, you would say that it wasn't a very good business decision. I, I think sometimes we try and force people into a situation where they don't, they really don't want to do it, and they go and they don't succeed in college and they wind up leaving college. So college is right for the right person. I, I remember once with my youngest son, who was very much thought he was in love with this young lady, and uh, he was questioning whether he should go on to college. And um, and I said to him, you know, you're your life will be depend upon what you do. And most important than anything else is if you do what you like, you'll ultimately be successful. But if you try to do something you don't like, you'll never be really successful. So college is important for some people, but I, I want to believe that there's still an opportunity in America for people who have drive, ambition, and passion to succeed whether they have a college degree or not. Well, even though I have three three college degrees, I, I'm, I agree wholeheartedly with you, Dan. And with that, Dan, uh, we're going to end uh, this program. Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. 
We hope the information you received on today's episode was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz, to contact us, to listen to past shows, and see special offers. Until next time, remember, if you grow, we grow. Join us next week for more helpful ideas to make your business a great success.